Hi, I'm Rob Marvin, Associate Features Editor of PC Mag here at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. And I'm here with Brian Bellendorf, the Executive Director of Hyperledger. We're going to tell you all about what Hyperledger is and what it does. But first, I wanted to start uh, on a bit of a higher level, um, you know, before we dig deep, um, just to talk about, uh, I guess, you know, for, for the general public out there, what do you find so exciting about blockchain? <laughs> so for many of us who've been on the internet for a long time, uh, there has been this creeping sense for, you know, from about 2005 onwards that the increasing adoption of the, of the internet and digital processes by, by businesses, by society, by government was going to lead to more centralization rather than decentralization, right? right? Uh, uh, and, and, and that we'd kind of, as technologists, inadvertently made it really easy to build 800-pound gorillas at the center of markets, at the center of communication systems, even if the internet originally came from a very cooperative, peer-to-peer, -peer decentralized place. Exactly. And so I, I think there was an intuition amongst many of us that you know, it wasn't just a, that, that open APIs weren't going to be enough. Even open source software wasn't enough to kind of return us to uh, try to try to make it easier and easier to get back to that. And, I, and, and there was some real hope with the Bitcoin paper when that came out in 2009 that maybe we could start to talk about economic models for decentralizing it as well and, and new tooling uh, to decentralize. And, um, some of us might not have gotten into the idea of, you know, a, a speculative financial instrument at the heart of the reinvention of the web. Uh, others thought that uh, maybe proof of work and the consumption of CPU power was was kind of an unfortunate architecture, right? Uh, and so, lots of people started to think, are there alternatives to doing this, right? Right. Uh, so, and and so and, we're separating we're separating cryptocurrency from blockchain. Well, you know, uh, really to say, cryptocurrencies are an application of blockchain right. technology, much like a website is an application of the web, right? So, so, uh, so. So in exploring these other areas, and I started to come back to this in about 2015, uh, I realized, hey, there's these other consensus mechanisms than proof of work. There's other smart contract languages one might use, and ways to build these systems uh, without needing a token to drive those consensus mechanisms. Uh, and around the same time, I saw this announcement by the Linux Foundation of this project called Hyperledger. And at first, I was kind of skeptical. It kind of, you know, it was IBM, and it was JP Morgan, and it was like the old guard kind of like looking, trying to look cool again, right? Um, but, uh, I, but I resonated with it, and I spent some time uh, attending some of the developer meetings and said, how can I help? Uh, and, uh, and Jim Zemlin, the executive director of the Linux Foundation, said, well, we could use somebody who could help run this. So I said, sure, why not? Right, yeah, because you came from uh, Apache and a lot of other open, you know, the, the open source boom, um, you know. Well, this like, is the first time I've had a full-time job doing what I do, uh, doing <laughs> something in open source. Um, uh, most of the time, it's been as a volunteer, right? Uh, uh, or trying to figure out how to map that into enterprise scenarios, such as the company Collabnet that I helped run for eight years, right? Um, but I have a, a rather, rather tortuous kind of uh, career path. You know, I worked in D.C. for a few years. I worked uh, uh, in the White House, um, and then I worked uh, for the World Economic Forum. I was chief technology officer there, and then I was doing venture capital just before coming to this. So lots of different things, but all of them kind of lending me towards this kind of both concern about centralization, but still a fundamental belief in open source software, open systems, and now distributed ledgers as a way to, 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 to fix some thorny problems in the world. Yeah. So all of that, of course, would lead you to blockchain. Um, so I guess, um, what do you see as kind of the greatest, you know, immutable decentralized potential for this kind of technology? I mean, there's there's a lot, but I'd say the thing, one of the things that gets me most excited right now is the potential to reinvent how digital identity works through decentralized ledgers, right? Through distributed ledgers. Um, there's a, a concept that's been floating around the digital ID space for a long time called self-sovereign ID, sometimes called user-centric uh, digital ID. Right. So ex and, explain how that works. Sure. And it, the, the, at a high level, you know, the difference between this and say login with Facebook, login in tw with Twitter, is that your identity shouldn't be encoded as you know, your entry as a row in a database somewhere but in one of these big companies, but instead something very indigenous to you, right? A wallet of some sort, keyed off of your, your biometrics, keyed off of passwords, keyed off perhaps of people who could recognize you if they were ever asked, is this really Brian, et cetera. Um, and then within that, the, you know, your keys that you use to manage that, you get attestations, you get claims. You know, here's uh, a, a Facebook might claim this, this guy's a Facebook user, so you can use this to log in elsewhere. Or a US government government might say, here's your passport, right? And your passport is simply a claim that this person with this ID is a US citizen and can travel, right? right. So pulling together a passport that has all these claims 
rather than being able to present these claims to prove it, is the, the reinvention model. I can use that to track uh, personal information as well and who I've shared that personal information with and to update that and even revoke access to that personal information. Um, and so this is a very different way of looking at this. And Hyperledger has a project called Hyperledger Indy, which is an implementation of self-sovereign ID. Uh, it's something we're working on with a number of different orgs to implement, but it's already being put into production services this, in production service this year. And the societal implications of that kind of ubiquitous identity, that you know, it gives users more control over kind of, you know, if we do it right, it gives right. them more control. And and as technologists, you know, there's a, a, a lot that we have to learn from when it comes to privacy by design. Often we're very eager to just start building things and assume that that the cost uh, privacy of data are trivial, well, they're really high. And the general data protection regulations, this ruling that is uh, coming to effect in May in the European Union, but will really affect every business, is kind of a peasants with pitchforks storming the Bastille moment in the digital ID space, because it's the citizen saying, we are sick of having companies uh, presume that they can just do whatever they want with our data. This is an approach that it gives the individual uh, agency to be able to know who their data is shared with and decide when it can be shared and to revoke that access at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, all right, so I want to get into Hyperledger specifically um, for a minute. Um, and at, for, as a primary for those who don't know, can you kind of explain what the standardization effort is and kind of, I guess, um, the cross-industry approach to how you're doing it? So the Linux Foundation has served as a home for collaborative development uh, of two kinds, or actually collaborative development between software engineers working together originally on the Linux operating system and now for over 50 different projects like Hyperledger, projects in cloud computing, software-defined networking, automotive, uh, uh, the, the core infrastructure initiative, which is a security project. All these things are, are you know, collections of developers working for many different reasons, but together on common code that they expect to be used in production systems. And that doesn't just happen on its own, right? Our role is not to tell people what to build, not to be air traffic controllers, so much as the supportive governance organization that makes sure that any time a developer shows up and wants to work, that we've got a way for them to work together productively. The second level is between businesses, um, helping them understand how to build a business model on top of open source software, how to see value from doing that, and how to work with each other without killing each other, right? So uh, that model, that template, turns out to be applicable to a lot of different technology domains. And so at Hyperledger, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, okay, in the field of distributed ledgers and smart contract systems, there's a lot to figure out. A lot of, uh, this, is, this is kind of a new, 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 new terrain compared to, say, operating systems, which have been around for a long time, right? right. Um, and it's, we have to kind of map that landscape. And so we've got nine different technology projects. Um, the identity project I mentioned is one. We have two others that have been, are now in production use, uh, Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Ledger Sawtooth, yeah. right? Um, uh, and a bunch of others as well. So, uh, uh, and, and all the goal is with all of them, get them to production releases, get the devs able to work together, and help the 200 and odd businesses and other organizations that have joined the Hyperledger effort to understand how to incorporate it into their products and services and do something interesting. And I want to illustrate that a little bit. You mentioned, you know, 200 plus members across um, healthcare, finance, payments, tech, um, you know, a broad number of use cases. You know, what are some of the more interesting ways that you've seen those members, you know, collaborate and, uh, you know, work together in maybe ways you didn't expect? Ways I didn't expect. Well, I mean, it's it's it, I've been immersed in it now, so it's hard to go. What what was unexpected? Um, uh, but I mean, the the supply chain scenario ends up repeating itself, right? So, uh, the first couple examples that I could use were diamonds, right? Uh, and the meat supply chain, where there's kind of a food safety thing, right? Um, the diamond, by the way, uh, supply chain. The the focus there is to keep blood diamonds out of circulation, right? So have a really hardened kind of uh, auditing system, so that when you have diamonds come from a known good source. Uh, their in the integrity of the handoffs from one party to another can be verified by anybody in that chain. Right? Is that, that's a company called Everledger? So Everledger is building a, a diamond supply chain project with SAP and IBM and a, and a bunch of the other uh, or, uh, organizations in the diamond industry. Um, uh, in the food safety uh, uh, project, there's uh, something with uh, involving Walmart and Nestle and a whole bunch of other supply chain companies uh, with IBM and some other companies helping provide support for that. Um, but there are, uh, what's interesting is a lot of these uh, 
uh, be also become the basis for trade finance. They become the basis of know your customer uh, kinds of, of uh, applications. They become like these generative platforms because once you have that data in a computable form, uh, uh, it can be used for lots of different things, right? So, um, so I guess what's surprising is how these things start as these very subtle use cases, right? Like, okay, let's stop the flow of uh, conflict of blood diamonds, right? But they become uh, a platform for so much more. Yeah, I think that shows the, the power of, I guess, kind of the, the frameworks that you're building that can be applied in so many different ways. It shows the power of data, for sure, yeah. And, and reliable data, right? We're not a big data tool. That's, I like to tell people we're a small data tool. <laughs> we're about like the most important data, who owns what. Right uh, or or what commitments have been made? I've promised to send you ten thousand dollars if it rains, you know, uh, uh, and floods, you know, uh, uh, in a in a certain place. Right? That's like an insur a weather insurance uh, contract. Right? Now that's something that can be executed automatically across the ledger, rather than a promise, you know, that I might you know, that I make to you that I might you know disappear uh, and and actually not fulfill. Right? Um, and that's called a counterparty risk. Right? And so as a tool to eliminate that. You know, you think back to the mortgage crisis in 2008, 2007, and the real damage from that came from this disorderly unwinding of these processes that right. many people believe, believe had the um, land titles been encoded on distributed ledgers and all of the kind of recordings of mortgages and had these instruments been defined as smart contracts, we might not, we still have had, we, we might have still had rampant speculation in that market, but we would have had a much more orderly unwinding of those investment instruments. Um, and hopefully, the same kind of like predictability and auditability and and verifiability that we could have brought there we could bring to other types of markets and and hopefully help manage the complexity that's of society that's going down a rather dark path it seems mm -hmm. and on that subject I wanted to uh, explain smart contracts a little bit sure which uh, I mean they're kind of uh, you know, one of Piper Ledger's projects burrow is kind of a um, just a, a blueprint for creating these smart contracts but um, I guess in fields like healthcare and IoT, can you explain why that kind of trusted data exchange that smart contracts uh, enable are, are so important? Sure. So, um, so smart contracts are going to be used for a lot of different purposes, right? But in essence, it means here's a function that anybody in the network can invoke that the network guarantees certain properties about. For example, so and by the way, Burrow is an implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine. Right. Uh, it can run on top of its own ledger, but there also is support for running on Sawtooth and coming up soon for running on top of Fabric. So we think that's one of the more interesting technologies to come out of the Ethereum community is this virtual machine, right? Um, but a smart contract, uh, again, can be used to encode a, a promise that I make about some condition in the future. Uh, it can be used to create derivatives. It could be used also, though, let's say in a healthcare setting, I could write a smart contract that grants you access to my healthcare information if you meet certain criteria, right? Like the person making the request is actually certified as a doctor uh, or as one of my doctors who uh, uh, is licensed to, to manage information about me. Right. Um, and it could also enforce a rule that says anybody who accesses this data, that access also gets logged onto the network. And all of this in encrypted form so that you know third parties, they can't see what that data is. But what I wanna know, you know, who, who's accessed my data and when, I have a very clear ledger of who did that, right? Um, so this kind of additional functionality makes these platforms very programmable and makes them very extensible, and that's, that's kind of why they're cool. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. <coughs> Smart contracts are, uh, yeah, I guess are really flexible. I mean, you talked about, you know, crypt cryptocurrency as an application on top of blockchain. Um, Smart contracts seem as though they're you know, another potential application that just has so many different use cases. It's it's what makes this a, a more exciting place. If we were just tracking assets, there'd be a lot of value to that. There's a lot of problems that are just about, uh, that are ledger style problems. And I think the first wave of production systems will predominantly focus on tracking of assets, on, on uh, uh, using the, just the pure recording of the ledger to verify, you know, really need smart contracts when it comes to tracing that a diamond went from point A to point B to point C, right? Um, um, but you do want it when you want to do anything creative from a financial perspective, when you want to do anything uh, uh, interesting from an access rights perspective, from a decryption perspective. Um, so, I, you know, I think I think there'll be a first wave, which is pure ledger, but followed within a year or two by, by a more programmable web. Looking very much like the original web, right? Where the first wave of websites were brochureware. Do you remember that term, right? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, they were static copies of, you know, the paper brochures that people put out with a little bit of CGI, you know, 
know, sprinkled it here and there. I remember that. Um, uh, and now, obviously, you know, if your website is just static, it's, it's not going to get much use. So, um, yeah, I think we'll see the same thing happen here. Um, and uh, Hyperledger has a, a bunch of projects in the hopper, but I thought it was worth uh, taking a little bit of time to talk about the two most mature ones. Um, you know, the, uh, fabric. fabric and Sawtooth are both um, in production now. So yeah. uh, could you take a little bit of time just to explain what each one is um, and what the goal is? Sure. So uh, first off, I should mention, you know, we took the perspective at Hyperledger that there isn't one true architecture that everybody needs to fall in line with. There's some really mature thinking going on in the fabric community that's based on years of distributed systems work that had happened inside of companies like IBM uh, before Hyperledger even began. Uh, and it kind of came from a, a history that those companies had had with transaction systems, with, with large scale, you know, mainframes even, right? You know, understanding what you really need to coordinate processes between multiple parts. Right, but kind of coming from a very rich databasey kind of world where finality was really important, uh, uh, where um, control over the end result was really important, control over the ledger was important, um, and so uh, uh, it's that's kind of its lineage, right? Um, but we said, you know, even before I joined, uh, uh, Intel had contributed their Sawtooth Lake project, which we renamed to Sawtooth, right. um, and uh, uh, and it took a very different approach. It kind of started from the other uh, end, which is let's look at the Bitcoin architecture, let's look. At, uh, uh, more of the cryptocurrency architectures and ask what's valuable about them in terms of the, 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 the fact that you can have lots and lots of nodes on a network, the fact that ledgers sometimes fork and diverge and then come back together, or the longest bran branch is the one that survives, right? Um, and so it's been a, 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 a kind of a playground for experimenting with a couple of different consensus mechanisms. One's called proof of elapsed time, and that's uh, something that uh, depends upon the secure enclave inside of Intel chips, potentially other makers' chips as they roll that out too. Um, uh, and, and it's also been a way to try to say, okay, um, what what many of the, the, the um, cryptocurrency ledgers get right is that they track not only data in the ledger, but also uh, state uh, and, uh, and the, and the um, uh, smart contracts as first class objects within the ledger. Everything gets versioned all the way through so that your world state that you compute from the ledger can look exactly, should look exactly the same as everybody else's, right? Um, and uh, Fabric takes a slightly different approach. Um, and constructing a consistent world state is actually really hard and there's some use cases that require it, a whole lot that don't. So in many ways, you know, the metaphor I've used for people is this is kind of like the difference between MySQL and Cassandra. Right at the hundred thousand foot view, these are both databases. Right, and when you drill down, you, uh, you know you start to realize they make different promises to the layer above. Right, eventual consistency versus asset compliance, um, and so much like those differences, you know we still don't know what's going to happen when developers start playing with this and deploying it and seeing where one meets their needs better than the other. But I'm confident they'll come up with uh, that kind of story, and at some point. Like with all the other projects we have at Hyperledger, if there's good ideas but they just don't get traction, then bringing those into other projects that do get traction is something our model allows. Everything's under the same license. All the development is public. The developers build you know, bridges between different projects around architecture and, and personnel and that sort of thing. So um, rethink this more organic approach to doing product management, you know, so to speak, uh, is perhaps better than if somebody was anointed as the architect and said, here's the one true path. Right. So I guess in, through that lens of or, you know, organic interoperability and the, the flexibility that you're building into all these processes, um, you know, what do you see as the future of blockchain, uh, I guess, in stages? First in the in this next couple of years and then kind of the, the longer big picture view. Well, um, I think we're at a, uh, an inflection point this year where there are proofs of concepts that have, have been done. There's pilots that are uh, in process or wrapping up, and we'll probably end the year with uh, several dozen, which sounds low, but several dozen large production deployments of this for different networks. Um, many of those will likely be public permissioned networks. Um, uh, you could think of the domain name system as a public permission network, you know, where everybody can read it, but you have to have certain rights to be able to write to the domain name system, right? right? And that. And that's, and that's appropriate. We, we understand how those models work. So there's a number that are being uh, prepared for launch this year uh, on top of Hyperledger's uh, code. And I think we'll, we'll get a better understanding of how to work with these technologies uh, 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 and, and see you know, an inflection point in terms of numbers of developers working with them as well. Right. And yeah, I mean, I feel like a question that always comes up uh, in the blockchain space is, you know, when are you going to see you know, an application that consumers will actually be able to um, interact with? Or are we finally hitting that point? 
Well, that's a little harder to answer. I mean, blockchain technologies are necessarily kind of a business to business integration thing. I mean, we, we do see cryptocurrency wallets and that sort of thing, but even then for most people, you know, they as individuals aren't conducting transactions on the ledger. Typically they're going through somebody like Coinbase or et cetera, sure. right? So the consumer impact, I mean, to them, it'll, it, here's what I hope. I hope that with the deployment of this, people will see data that's more portable. They'll see their identity information be something they can manage rather than needing to depend upon third parties or silos of data, right? Uh, so this whole distributed uh, uh, data kind of concept, right? Uh, distributed ID uh, concept. Um, uh, I think they'll, you know, hopefully their expectations about uh, uh, how how information systems work will be different. It's hard to m for me to predict though. This is really much more of a business to business uh, story, I think. Sure. Um, uh, I guess uh, finally I hope it means that people will expect that even though they're users of service A, that being able to switch to service B becomes not just something that's possible to do. In many cases, it's not even possible. You can't take your Uber ride history with you over to Lyft, right? Or your, your good rating as an Uber driver, Uber driver or Uber passenger over to Lyft. You can't take that now, right? Hopefully with these technologies, the consumers will come to expect that and demand that and realize it's not hard to provide that kind of portability between providers. Right, so is it about, I guess, changing the, the mindset that we've all been conditioned into based on you know the internet that we've interacted with for the past few decades? Does decentralizing it um, you know, require a, a change in how we think about no, because I think it's actually a return to how people expect the real world to work. They don't expect, you know, inside of a space of two years, one company to control all the cabs in the world, right? Uh, they expect that, you know, you know, to be able to hail a cab and have that be a relationship between themselves and the cabbie, and maybe the, you know, the, the, you know, some, some, you know, services that help be, you know, introduce the two parties to each other. But this world is made up of, and it's great when there is this really heterogeneous kind of environment for people to be able to engage each other with businesses and services. And the technology should support that rather than treat that as an aberration. Sure. So before we get to kind of, I guess the. Um you know, closing what's what's coming in the in the next few months. Uh, it's I think you certainly hit on the fact that it, this is a B two B play. It's really um, the businesses that are driving this, and I, you know, we're we're trying not to get it conflated too much with um, banking and finance. But those are a lot of the companies that are driving the innovation right now. Um, can you I guess wh why do you think blockchain is so uh, you know that why, why do you think the the banking and finance community uh, is investing so much in the technology? What, what do you think the value is there? Well, I think. They understand the word ledger <laughs> more deeply than most others do, right? Um, and they perceive most directly the costs of point-to-point -point reconciliation of ledgers uh, and the potential for unified distributed ledgers to, to cut time and cut money. Um, so when you wire, send a bank wire to somebody, especially in another country, that can take three days and cost, what, $30, you know, if you wanted to do it in a rush. Um, it should take five minutes and it should cost 25 cents or less, right? right? And, uh, uh, and, that, and, and that's why SWIFT themselves, SWIFT, the, 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 the banking network organization that runs the predominant network that connects these banks, are themselves running a distributed ledger trial to see can we use this technology to make those transactions faster and cheaper, right? Um, and so I think we're gonna see, just like with the internet, this isn't a death knell for any company in particular, any sector in particular. This, just like the internet, is something that uh, every company will have to be aware of and think about how it affects their business model. Um, and the more that their business model looks like a gatekeeper to transactions, right, the more it's likely to be disrupted and, and will force a reinvention, just like the encyclopedia companies had to reinvent themselves in light of the internet, right? Um, so so that's, that's, I think, the story that's going to play out over the next 10 years. Sure, that kind of foundational, you know, gradual foundational shift. Yeah. Um, and then, I guess, finally, uh, I, let's talk about what's next for uh, Hyperledger in the coming months. I mean, what are the milestones you um, are really excited about? Yeah. So we've got nine projects, two of which have gotten to a 1.0 release and are in production. And those will obviously, they have a head of steam around them. We'll see further releases around those. Um, I'm eager to get as many of the other projects to that 1.0 release as we can. Uh, and it looks like we'll have at least three or four this year that'll do that. Um, and those are, that's an, it might sound minor, it's like a 1.0, what are our expectations? For us, 1.0 is a signal that the developers are comfortable with you using this software in production systems with real digital assets, a pretty high bar, right? So, um, but that's, that's our goal, is to take this stuff and pull it down a pipeline to get it into use. Um, we'll probably see more projects added. Uh, I don't really have a, a crystal ball. It's kind of not up to me. 
I mean, we, uh, we wait around for projects to be proposed to us by the people who've written the code, right? Um, we're not like a, a Microsoft or a Google, you know, where we say, there's the direction we're heading in and let's uh, attack. We are much more organic. So we've had some people show up and say, we'd like to do a project uh, in, in smart contracts, do a project in payment networks, do a project in different things. If, uh, and the, uh, it's actually a public process run by the technical steering committee to decide which of those projects get adopted and brought into the organization. So uh, if anyone's interested in following that, there's a public mailing list they can see uh, this stream of proposals come in on. And are there, uh, I guess, pie-in-the-sky applications of, of, I mean, uh, applications for blockchain technology that you'd love to see a project come in for that, that um, well, I think I think uh, um, certainly certainly in the payments world, uh, we think there's some work to do. I mean, you can tokenize anything you want on top of Fabric or on top of Sawtooth, but I think there's some interesting innovation happening um, that we could learn from the cryptocurrency world, but doesn't necessarily involve proof of work. Um, so interesting stuff happening there. I think uh, I think getting into more sector specific things too, like what would it mean to do a healthcare records uh, ledger, right? It's something that allows patients to be at the center of health information exchange, right? Um, what you know? What's a collection of smart contracts and business logic, and maybe even end-user interfaces that would make that possible? Sure. Right? And does that tie back into uh, identity as well? It does. It does. And in fact, I think a really big thing that we could do is I'm, I even wonder if we could take that on, or if it has to be something somebody like Mozilla is a standardized wallet, right? To this world, the wallet is what the browser was to the web. Right, and it needs. We need a wallet that acts as your agent, acts as your proxy, not just something given to you by a website to use. Right, um, because this is something that should form a long-term relationship with you. Somebody should build one. It sh it's got to be open source. It's got to be multi-vendor, multi-stakeholder. Um, and you know, there's lots of ideas out there about how to get there. Um, but that that that's perhaps more the the, the moonshot. In right. My well, maybe we'll see that wallet that you actually control. But that'd be great. Yeah. For now, uh, I guess there's going to be a lot more uh, blockchain innovation to come in 2018. Um, thanks so much for taking the time, Brian. My pleasure.